Hello everybody and a very warm welcome to the British Library Food Season, which is generously supported by KitchenAid. My name is Angela Clutton. It is my complete joy and delight to be the guest director of the Food Season, working with Polly Russell, who founded the season four years ago and is its curator. Um, thank you so much for joining us for tonight's event. It is set to be a fascinating conversation with Babita Sharma, Ruby Tando, Penn Vogler and Dee Woods. Um, before we get started, just a little bit of housekeeping. You should be able to see some tabs on screen where you can give feedback on the event. You can read a little bit more about tonight's speakers and find their books or maybe make a donation to support the work of the British Library. Um, we hope you also might be like to ask, ask a question of the panel yourself. Uh, so under this video, you should see a box where you can type your question in and also the social media links so you can join in the conversation on other platforms too. You should also see there are details for a competition being run for the food season with KitchenAid where you can win a copy of Karen Franklin's book, The Pie Room, uh, a place on a virtual cooking class and some uh, KitchenAid cordless kit. And so to tonight's event, which is exploring a breadth of issues around food and taste and class. We have formidable contributors to this discussion, Ruby Tando, Penn Vogler and Dee Woods. For Peter Sharma, we'll be steering the conversation and I'll let her introduce the panel. But first of all, a few words on the beta. Broadcaster, author, familiar face and voice across BBC News with work including BBC Breakfast, BBC World News and Newsday. Also an author, as I say, of the critically acclaimed book, The Corner Shop. Uh, Babita grew up above the corner shop in 1980s Britain, and so her book gives a fascinating perspective of the plot of the political and economic climate during her childhood, all through the lens of corner shop life. Um, I think there can be no one better place to steer us through the next hour or so of conversation. And so Babita, over to you. Uh, yeah, great. Thank you so much for um, joining joining us all this evening. And I'm thrilled to be chairing this panel session. We have got, as Angela just said, a great lineup. So without any further delay, I'm going to introduce them to you. We have Ro Ruby Tando, who's a writer and author. And Ruby has an expertise in exploring the places where food merges with popular culture, politics, uh, art and identity. So I'm really fascinated to be talking to Ruby about that. Uh, she might be a familiar face to many of you. She was also in the television show Bake Off, uh, reaching the final. Well done, Ruby, for that. And uh, she's also the author of Eat Up, the audiobook that came out in March, Breaking Eggs, and the upcoming book, Cook As You Are, which is coming out in October, October the 7th, I think. And it talks about how we can all create magic from the most mundane of ingredients. Hallelujah. Thank you so much for that, Ruby. It's great to have you with us. Uh, we also have Penn Vogler, who is a well-known face to many of you, a food historian and author of the critically acclaimed fantastic book, Scoff, A History of Food and Class in Britain. She has written lots, including Dinner with Mr. Darcy on Food in Life and Works of Jane Austen, Dinner with Dickens and guest curated the exhibition Food, Glorious Food at the Charles Dickens Museum. She edited Penguin's Great Food series, has written a lot about food history for the BBC and the media, and we created lots of recipes from the past as well for the media here in the UK. So Penn, welcome to you. And also we have Dee Woods, who is a food and farming actionist and campaigner who advocates for good food for all and for more just and equitable food system, challenging these systemic barriers that impact marginalised communities, farmers and food producers. Uh, Dee is the co-founder of Granville Community Kitchen in South Kilburn and sits on the GLA London Food Board, the steering group of People Food Power and is co-editor of a People food policy among lots of other things as well Dee welcome to you thanks so much for being with us ladies there is so much to chat about but firstly from the off let's have a conversation about what food tells us about who we are Ruby gosh that's a big one to start with isn't it um, I mean it obviously it, it what we eat it's such an old kind of it's almost a cliche at this point to be honest but what we eat tells us so much about I don't know who we are where we come from where we want to go importantly there's quite a lot of there's an aspirational element to it as well but I think as well what we eat isn't just um like a code to be deciphered I think it it kind of also says something about the person judging the food so if I see someone's shopping basket yeah maybe it tells me a little bit about who they are if I'm kind of behind the Tesla and I'm having a look but it also says something about what I think the associations are of those foods and the baggage that I bring into it. So it kind of 
it's illuminating on all counts and in all directions, I think. Yeah, and you bring up the um, brilliant example of what's in somebody's shopping basket, because we, of course, all like to have a bit of a peer. But what is it, what, what is it about that that you think that we have the right to judge or feel that we have the right to judge other people's eating habits? Um, I, can't, I mean, I think we're, we're, quite, we're famously nosy people, so I, I think that doesn't help. But more generally, I think that, you know, there's so much cultural baggage, um, emotional, like geographic, everything, like everything that comes into a food can tell us so much about time and place and what kind of a person that you are and all of this stuff. So I think it's, it's very natural to look at someone's shopping basket um and and to be curious and to want to try and understand them through the things that you see in that and also through the foods that they cook and whether they're good at cooking or not whether they dine out a lot or not whether they buy the pre-roll puff pastry or not all of these things come together to form a picture that may or may not be accurate about who we think that person is how accurate do you think we are pen in our judgment of people's shopping baskets as ruby puts it but but also just how we view food how we consume it how it you know is very much part of our being in the uk i, I think ruby's absolutely right is that we use other people's shopping baskets and cupboards and what's on their dining tables and what time they eat and what they call their meals all these things we use them to judge each other um and and, and it's it's crazy because if you if somebody has a avocado and their shopping baskets and the a next the next person has a tin of mushy peas, they're both green. They both have you know vitamin C and all the rest of it. But nearly everybody in this country will be absolutely sure that the avocado is the most middle class thing ever, which is kind of what it's been called in the in the papers over and over again. Whereas we're all pretty much sure now that a tin of mushy peas is not, you know, it has a, a kind of northern associations for lots of people, which is good in my book. I come from Yorkshire. But um, or you can have a look at two other things, you know, a tin of smash or a little packet of instant couscous. And again, although they're both carbohydrates, they're both instant. We know exactly how to how we would place somebody from that. And I think it goes back for centuries really in Britain, that idea that um, we have this idea that different people eat, different people of different classes, different people of different kind of rungs on the kind of socioeconomic ladder have the right to eat different food. And that's a, a, an idea that's come, that we still see, can't seem to shake off. And I'm sure we'll get around to it later, but there's a sort of this, this kind of sheet anchor of an idea that kind of holds us back because we think it's natural for people with a certain income or, you know, to be eating foods that other people would, wouldn't want to. Whereas I think in other countries, there's a different, I mean, my sister grew up in France, for example, and um, she said there, everybody kind of agrees about what is good food, what to aspire to. They all kind of know what it is. And even if you can't afford it, you aspire to it. And I think a lot of that, uh, a lot of that judgment comes from our kind of obsession or centuries long obsession with social class. And that, that is a very British thing as well, Dee. What is it about us Brits where we have, well, one, an obsession with it, but also the judgment, or we feel that we have the right to pass a judgment on what people eat? Um, I think it's a very British thing, but a particular viewpoint. Um, and a view from a place of privilege. Um, so for a lot of British people, you know, they don't even subscribe to that. They just want to eat the food, you know, from their region, um, from, you know, their, their culture. So, you know, Welsh people love their particular foods and they're not about to change that for something English. Um, and, you know, I think, yes, some people want to move up the rung, but for other people, because food holds so, so much in terms of um, memory and family and connection, you know, food, food is much, much more than just class. Yeah, for me, uh, food is very much part of my identity. It's part of my history. It's part of my ancestry. It's part of my understanding of who I am. And, and 
I, you know, we were talking about this before we went live with this, with this chat. And I was telling you about how I was often embarrassed when we lived above the corner shop about admitting to friends at school in a very white part of Reading where I grew up that we were having Indian cooking and I'd always want to be like no no we're having fish fingers and chips um and, and there was something in me that wanted to kind of fit in because in 80s yeah. Britain being having Indian cooking or the smells of Indian cooking wasn't necessarily celebrated like it is today where you have aisles of supermarket shelves with exotic cuisines so with that in mind what do you believe D is the narrative around the conversation with food in class and immigration. Yeah. Um, so starting with exoticizing the food it is part of that. You know, most of these foods are everyday foods. Some are celebratory foods. Um, and, you know, Britain has this long history with elsewhere and getting our foods from elsewhere. And... You know, there, there's that legacy of sort of sugar and spices um, that has been part of people's diets. And I think immigration within the last century just sort of expanded the Briti British palate. Yeah. For some, though, so, maybe, right? Maybe for some. I don't know. Does anybody... Uh, maybe would um, you... I think maybe for some, because I'm, I know at Granville, we still work with people who just want their meat and two veg. And that's perfectly fine. No one's judging them for that. But do you, but do you think there is a, a way now where we're perhaps a bit more open to a different palate or being introduced to different cuisine than perhaps we were 10 or 20 years ago. Ruby, Penn, do you want to jump in? Um, I mean, I guess one thing that, that strikes me is like, yeah, like for example, if you just walk around a supermarket, which as it happens is one of my favorite things to do in the world, um, you know, there's so much more selection, there's so much more choice than there was even 10 years ago. I recently went back to my hometown in South End and I couldn't believe what I was seeing. Like there was a Polish shop and there were West African shops and there were things that just didn't exist. So there is more selection in terms of food. But I also think that there is a little barrier between that food as it is provided by, uh, bought by, eaten by the people who belong to that culture and then that food when it enters the mainstream. And I think quite often what, what needs to happen, you know, this is one of the problems with our food culture at the moment, what needs to happen for it to enter the mainstream in any significant way is it needs to be like decoded um, by a kind of a trusted figure. And most of the time that trusted figure will be someone who is, just for example, this is not a, a criticism of this person in particular, but Rick Stein, someone who can go to a different place and make that, that food accessible to other people and and who can you know I, I guess just give it an acceptable and and quite often this means a white face and and to make it accessible in that way so well, there's can, definitely that issue can you give me an example of the food type that you're referring to that you think needs to be under the spotlight a bit more well just for example like let's just talk about west african food because that's something that i know a bit about that's part of my heritage like it has really struggled to kind of become mainstream in the way that some other foods have, for sure. And I think some of that is to do with misconceptions about it being stodgy or oily or whatever. And these really offensive stereotypes, but they're stereotypes that persist. But I definitely can see the slow infiltration of other ways of branding and packaging and communicating about that food that makes it more acceptable to people. So. You know, a plate of jollof rice might become a rice bowl, which is, you know, kind of taking the language of wellness or something like that. And so repackaging this food and making it just a bit more palatable to people. So there's definitely that kind of translation that goes on. And I don't think it's straightforwardly bad. I think it's, it's very complex, though, and I think it can be flattening. Both of you, Penn and Dee, you're nodding away there. Uh, Penn, to you first. I mean, those stereotypes, tell us a little bit more about where you think they come from and how they've evolved over the many, many years uh, and your extensive research. I'm putting you on the spot now, but if you can. Well, there are so many, I mean, it, British food has always been 
quite absorptive. So we have, over the centuries, we've taken on, you know, dangerous new foods like potatoes and tomatoes. And it took two or 300 years for people to genuinely think that potatoes were edible and wouldn't poison you, or to think that eating a raw tomato wasn't gonna kind of send you straight into hospital. You know, there was a lot of um, anxiety and prejudice against things. Whereas interestingly, meat is one of the things which, which on the whole we've kind of prioritized and any, you know, a turkey coming into this country for the first time has no, ex, you know, no difficulty with being accepted. But I think Ruby's absolutely right that often foods are kind of brought into the mainstream by being kind of Britishized or kind of homogenized in a way. And tea is a really interesting example of this because tea obviously started off in China. When Pepys had his first cup of tea, he called it a China drink I never had before. Um, and we had a lot of problems with kind of trading with China and it wasn't until it became British because it was grown in India and the Indian tea plantations were kind of, you know, overseen by good British men, that it started to feel... You could probably take issue with that, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, this is all in inverted commas. Yeah. If you can't see me, I'm, I'm wagging my little fingers like, like mad. And, um, and then it's... And so the, if you look at the... And this is something Ruby said as well. If you look at the, the sort of marketing as a way that things like tea, not so much coffee, but tea and cocoa and chocolate particularly, they all the kind of the origin story gets sort of expunged and it becomes a very, very British thing. So a kind of a bar of dairy milk or a Swiss thing, bizarrely, or Belgian thing with chocolate. But tea became this ultimate British thing in the way that mashed potatoes became a kind of ultimate British thing, even though there'd be huge prejudice against it, them when they were seen as Irish, for example. So we've managed to kind of overcome lots of prejudices for food and how I guess the jollof rice thing is interesting because whether whether will that become like uh, fish and chips for example which started life as um, Jewish fried fish and probably French or possibly Belgian fried potatoes and then it begets kind of again kind of absorbed into the mainstream and we suddenly think it's the most British, British thing ever although it's actually only been around together for about 100 years 120 years. I mean you're making me think about every single thing that I've consumed today and, and where it's come from and, and if I think that well actually let's put it in a different way um have you had your evening meal your supper your dinner? Uh, what you, was it? Have you all managed to eat before we started? No, no, shaking of the heads. Okay, what are you going to eat this evening then, ladies? D. I am going to slum it. And <laughs> notice my choice of words, slum it, and have some fast food, which I normally don't have. As someone who cooks and believes in good, good food, all right? But um, I think we're romanticizing how a lot of our foods have become part of sort of British cuisine. Um, there's a lot of co-option and violence and um, gentrification of, of foods. Um, you know, and a lot of foods don't become mainstream until it's co-opted with a white middle class face, you know, front, front in it. So I can go to someone and probably get an authentic sort of, um, and I wouldn't even say Caribbean because um, there's so many different cuisines within the Caribbean. You know, it's so vast. There's more to Caribbean food than rice and peas. But yet, you know, that's what we're presented, rice and peas, and often very bad rice and, and peas. So, yeah. I mean, the reason I was asking you all about what you're going to eat or yeah. you know, actually the point, a serious point, which is about our understanding of, you know, how we're going to the table, the, the consciousness, the conscious decisions that we make about food and also understanding the history that Penn was pointing out and Dee, you've just done mm -hmm. there as well. Because as you've just said, a lot of it is tied up with trade, money, history, slave trade, a lot of it by colonization, a lot of it by migration as well. Um, and 
interesting that you you pointed out your choice of words d slumming it that you're having a takeout whereas ruby would say in your book you've just said this ruby don't be ashamed of going for the takeout right yeah i mean i guess it's the, there are different ways to approach this like i i personally i guess it so much of it's reactive right so i mean i came to food writing kind of by accident in a way and what I saw there were, was so much judgment, so much judgment about the kinds of foods that I grew up eating or I, even not just eating, but feeling was really special. Like I, if, if I got um, a McDonald's, for instance, I understand the huge like ethical complications of that. But if I did get it, I thought it was special. It, it felt really special. It felt expensive. It felt like a luxury. And I kind of entered the world of food writing, encountering so much judgment from people. And it was just completely written off uh, as even recognized as food so like when I come to it I bring that to the table and I kind of feel like why shouldn't it be a treat why shouldn't it be fun why shouldn't it be enjoyable and that doesn't mean that there's nothing to critique in it because I think there are lots of things to critique I think people need access to far more food than just that but then there's definitely something that, that's that's good and that above all is delicious in it but that doesn't obviously negate these point of view because D comes so strongly from this point of advocating for people to have access to more nutritious foods and to have that choice rather than just being pushed into a food desert where you can't have anything but processed foods mm. and fast foods. So, yeah, and and I, we're going to explore that now actually in more detail. Um, but before we lay out the stool a little bit, I'm just wondering, Penn, if you can perhaps assess for us how we have got to a situation where food has become a problem. There are food inequalities in the UK. I don't think any of us would dispute that, would we? Just wanna check that we're all thinking that. Um, Pem, where, where have we got to when we're in the Western world and we are, one, some would describe as a wealthy, rich nation in, globally? I think on the, if you look at it on a very, very long timeline, you could possibly summarise it with, there's a brilliant uh, kind of post Second World War Hungarian comedian. And he said, on the continent, people have good food and in Britain, they have good table manners. And I think in Britain, historically, we've been so obsessed with all the stuff around food, the table manners, the etiquette, the way that the dinner parties, the way that food is aspirational or, you know, makes a kind of statement about your status. We've had far too much, and, and also not now, but before the, between about 1900 and about, I guess, the, again, the Second World War, um, sorry, 1800 and about the Second World War, there was this massive obsession with French food as well. And so this idea that only good food or kind of high, high status food was French food. And the, the Welsh food, or for example, that Dee was talking about, just wasn't considered to be worth, you know, worthwhile or worthy. So I think on the long, on the long kind of, you know, time span, there's that. And then on the shorter time span, there's a reluctance by governments to get involved in what people eat. There seems to be, I mean, the government seems to be very happy to, you know, spend our taxes and tell us, you know, where, you know, be involved in our um, our health and all the and um, our education and all the rest of it. But there's very little kind of government intervention, I think, in in, in health and nutrition and messaging and all the rest of it. So that's one reason, I think. Yeah, we don't have a government spokesperson here to no. uh, because there probably isn't a government spokesperson really well, you know well, there is a health minister and i know from just you know being a journalist in the industry that they they would probably turn around and say that they are doing very much to help with you know food tokens uh, but there isn't a food minister because in the in the second world war when, which is possibly the last time the government took nutrition really seriously, there was a minister for food. Yeah. And, yeah. I, and, and yeah. I think that's why we have the national food strategy yeah. now, because, you know, our food has become the preserve of sort of the big corporations, big agriculture, and there's very little 
governance by our, our governments, yeah, within our food systems. And we do have food systems rather than one big food system. So, you know, for health of people, for health of planet, we have to intervene. Let's just talk about those food systems that you mentioned, Dee. Can you just uh, yeah. explain to us what you mean by that and, and where we're at and why we're in the situation that we're in today? Right. So we have this big global food system um, and the architect is Britain in terms of, you know, going elsewhere to get food. And as a result of that, sort of developed systems of oppression so that merchants could, you know, benefit um, and make profit. So basically um, capitalism, patriarchy, racism to justify, you know, so uh, why people should be enslaved or indentured or go through apprenticeship. Um, and those systems have continued but and morphed into different things, but there's still sort of oppression so that we get the cheap foods, so that we get the chocolates and coffee and all, all these, these things. Um, but within that, you know, people have their local food systems. I love our sort of cultural um, suitcase food system where people bring foods, you know, from sort of ancestral places and share with communities and families just to keep that, that con connection. Um, but what we have is like this intricate sort of food system that, no one truly really understands how, how it works. And for people doing sort of food system analysis, food system change, you know, we're, we're peeling back the layers to try and understand how it works. Yeah. I mean, it's incredibly, incredibly intricate, very complicated as well. But I mean, uh, if I was to play devil's advocate here, which I'm going to do, the government would turn around and say there aren't food inequalities in this country. We're doing our very best. We acknowledge that there have been issues that have been raised by Marcus Rashford and we are trying to address that and we champion that. But if he wasn't around, maybe we wouldn't have been championing that. Who knows? But I mean, there is uh, there is an interesting conversation about this, which is deny, deny, deny. Oh, accept, accept, accept. Uh, yeah, we're doing something about it. So I'm just kind of wondering in that state of play, where we are, having come out of a lockdown in 2021, there is a food inequality in this country. How um, do we go about addressing it? I mean, Dee, I'll just give uh, Ruby a chance because I know she's uh, yeah. shaking her head like that. Well, nodding it, in fact, when you've been chatting. So, I mean, Ruby, where are we at with this conversation about food inequality in the UK? I honestly, I'm not the right person to answer this question. I don't, I don't have any of the answers. Um, I mean, Dee is someone who's actually working kind of there in the thick of it, kind of do, trying to do stuff behind the scenes and also doing stuff on the front line as well. So I'd yeah. love your view though, because um, I don't have the answers either, but I'm, <laughs> I know Dee has a lot and I, and I really want to give Dee the opportunity to explore that, but I'd love to just get your thoughts on what she's just said as well. Yeah, I mean, I think so much of it is going to be about moving beyond just it, it is a weird mix I, I i personally would like more the government to do more to take on more to be more proactive about providing foods where it's needed and taking that responsibility onto themselves rather than in this kind of dog eat dog every man for himself every man is his own responsibility kind of mindset so i would like the government to do more top down but then also I'd, I'd want to resist the kind of almost inevitable flattening of things if the government were to do that, you know, you kind of see it sometimes in, even in charitable interventions and things like food banks, where the things that are donated or the things, whether that's by individuals or by supermarkets or whatever it is, tend to be a certain kind of food. So we got, get a lot of tins, we get a lot of pasta, um, you know, apples and, and things like that. But where what about if someone doesn't eat those foods necessarily what if your staple food is millet what if your staple food is plantain or something like that and so you know it, it kind of leaves people out when you have these massive interventions so I think there's kind of I would imagine and this is 
you know, as I said, not coming from a, any position of expertise, that there's a sweet spot where there is so much more money, so much more funding and attention given to these things, but also the freedom for individual communities to rally around, to use that funding how seems right to them and to provide the food that's culturally important to and relevant to and, and desired by the people that they serve. It's always got to be better building it from the ground up, right? Um, Dee, go ahead, because I know you've got a lot that you want to share with us about the work mm. that you've been doing on this. Yeah, so sort of really agreeing with what Ruby has said. Um, I think we need to understand that the food inequalities we have in this country are because of socioeconomic inequalities. Um, we've had sort of 10 years plus of austerity um, that have undermined people's ability to be able to afford food. Um, we have people in sort of zero hour contracts, you know, not receiving a real living wage or even a living income to be able to afford things. And food has become, you know, that thing that isn't as important as paying your rent or getting to work. So, which is why we end up with yeah, these food inequalities. Alongside that, we have, um, a, we have a country where we're dependent on Europe for like 98% of our fruit and veg. So we're not as food secure as we think. Um, we only produce about half of our own food. Yeah, I mean, I, I suppose it, it, ooh, it's quite difficult to have that chat post-Brexit, yeah. right? So, I mean, we're... Uh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> had to bring it in, but, yeah, no. That's, yeah, that figure. Ooh, I don't even know where it is now. I, I don't even want to even guess yeah. where it is. But... I am for the farmers and amongst us. We know we're in the hungry gap. So for people importing food um, from Europe, you know, it's like there's hardly anything there because no one really wants to work with us um, as a country. Um, and then throw the pandemic in and all the issues there where farmers literally don't have enough workers. Another thing, migrant workers, um, they turned in crops. They weren't able to sow enough things. You know, so, so many factors, yeah. right? But the main thing here is about economics yeah and I we just, do need a government yeah to address that yeah. can i add something to what Dee is saying actually there's um there was a very good series bit of work done by sarah o'connor in the financial times about um low paid workers in the food industry yeah. and she said if we drive down the prices of food constantly how do these people feed themselves and she said, actually, if you look at food prices in Britain, they are probably amongst the lowest in Europe. But if you look at um, the price of accommodation and rent and mortgages and all the rest of it, they're amongst the highest in Europe. And actually, rather than driving down the cost of food all the time, which is, this, which is the assumption that that's what you've got to do to feed people, you've got to make food cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. And if that means taking out the nutrition and if that means ultra processing it, then so be it. You know, there's an assumption that's the only way to go. Whereas I think what you're saying, Dee, it is just, it is part of a much, much bigger system where you have to look at why are people not eating because they've got to pay their rent? Why is their rent so high? So the, the proportion of money that people used to pay on food would be about 70 or 80 percent of their income 100 or 200 years ago. And I'm not saying that we should be in that situation, but I do think we should question the kind of balance, the amount of if people don't have enough money to spend on food when our food is actually comparatively cheap, then there's something wrong in the whole system, not just the food system. But that's a massive Thing yeah. and I yeah gosh if we had more time so huge isn't it yeah maybe hours years maybe even we would be able to try and get to the nub of this but like you said Dee and Ruby and Penn you know there are so many different layers to this um I recently did an interview with somebody from the World Food Program the United Nations who talked about how giving a nutritious basic meal to children in developing countries sets them up for life in terms of their mental health in terms of their 
opportunity to study in school, in terms of their relationships with other people. Food is at the very basic heart of nourishing soul, mind, heart, all the rest of it. And for some reason, we seem to have lost sight of that in the UK. And she used an example of what was happening here in terms of food inequality. Um, I, I don't know really what you both all think actually in terms of who gets to define food in Britain today. Um, and I'll let you decide how you want to choose that word of define. Mm. And who's in control or power or whatever but Penn who do you think defines it? Do you mean in terms of of who gets to eat what or what we think about or our kind of impressions of what is the, the fashionable food or something? What I'm almost thinking on a, le on a level of those in power and how they get to define, because I think we've all probably set out an understanding that it is those in power that then feeds through into, feeds through, but you know, into exactly what we're doing and how we're consuming food. So perhaps, yeah, address, if you can um, talk about who defines food in that respect, and then maybe also in terms yeah. of how we might have control with what we're eating. If you look at the history of vegetarianism, it's very interesting because actually, Vegetarianism started in this country probably 400 years ago. It's got a longer history than we probably think about it. And at first it was all sort of, it was um, supported by working men as a way of kind of improving themselves, becoming maybe more spiritual, but sort of self-improvement. And for centuries, it was sort of addressed to working men that that's what they should do. They should change their diet, stop eating meat and become vegetarian. And actually in some ways, maybe working, you know, um, agricultural men or men who work in factories or something are not necessarily the people who define, you know, who make food fashionable. Um, and, it, and you can see with vegetarianism, it was when, you know, influ much more influential people and bloggers and, and celebrities, and often women as well, particularly women rather than men who were more influential. And I think on the, there, so there are kind of two answers to that. There's a kind of domestic level. And on the domestic level, housekeepers and cooks and mothers have always been the people who kind of in negotiation with their families, and that's an interesting thing, end up deciding what is not fashionable, but what you're gonna have to eat. And then you, obviously, as we know, historically it's been chefs and historically chefs have been male who kind of decide on what's fashionable. Um, and that kind of, that sort of filters down. And then there's a, this is your expression, Ruby, there's maybe a sweet spot where the two things kind of meet and people decide that, you know, this kind of food is what, we, what we're eating at the moment. But it's quite interesting because going back to what Dee was saying about people liking to eat regional food, people in Wales liking to eat their own food. I think one of the things that has been hopeful in, in recent years is that if you look at the Ritz's menu, which I've done online, not actually in the Ritz, it's, it's all like a, it's basically a gastro pub. It's all British, you know, British beef and- They're gonna blah, love blah. you for saying that, I think. <laughs> the rest of it, <laughs> it's all right, I'm not gonna. And, um, and I just think that's a really interesting mm. move in the last 20 or 30 years where, the kind of this concept that everything, you know, those high end hotels that you, everything used to be in French, for example, and now it's all about English and regional food. And I think that's a very positive move, but what you really want is to make that good local English, all those words that we recognize as being a desirable, fresh farmer's market, organic, all those things, you make, you want to make those available to everybody okay. as a choice. Sure. You know, it's all about, as Ruby was saying, it's all about making sure that everybody has a choice. Yeah, well, so with that in mind then, Ruby, I mean, I could say that you're defining food in the UK today with your books, but uh, who would you say is defining it for everyone? Um, I mean, what I found really interesting, actually, Penn, about your book, and it really helped me to understand a few things, is when you were talking about vegetarianism, for instance, the role that the church had and Lenten fasts and things like this had in shaping people's diets. Mm. And so in the past, maybe we've had the church and maybe we've had 
you know, certain kind of heavy handed forms of governance that shape what we can eat. But now I think, especially with this government and, and this links to what Dee was saying about like the lack of a food minister and things like this, that it, it's such a hands-off approach. And when there's nothing coming from above, no, no choice provided or no guidance given, there's a vacuum to fill. And that vacuum is filled with people like us, kind of people talking on panels about food, but also by celebrity chefs and by influencers and by companies, very importantly. And so you have all of these competing voices and, and so much of the kind of conversation that comes out of that becomes about class or it becomes about race and it and it all becomes about how do you want to define yourself it's very little about what might be good for you what would you like to access what connects you to who you really are and all of these things it's um it becomes very crowded and it's very noisy in this in-between space where we're kind of left to fend for ourselves and and to either follow the whims of of food fashion or to kind of try and step out alone whatever that means so I agree with you. And I think that I think that almost the thing that's missing is food. You know, it, 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 we're, we're so interested in kind of what food says about us and identity and all the rest of it that sometimes we forget to look at. We forget to start with the food. And that's what you do in Eat Up, isn't it? You start with the, the food that you like or that suits you. But I also think maybe social media has had its role to play. And I know, Ruby, you spoke about TV chefs and and cooking competitions, but as you well know, but of course that has almost changed as well, a reality TV program about our understanding or relationship with food in a, in a very kind of glitzy, glamorized way. Um, Dee, I just want to give you the opportunity to just fill us in on your views about the definition of who's in control of the food debate in the UK today. Um, I think the corporations sort of big businesses you know the free market are in control but at the same time from the bottom up we have communities um we have farmers who are literally challenging that and saying well these are the foods we want to eat these are what we think is good for our health um good for our communities good good for you know the in environment um, I'm trying not to be influenced by social media or celebrity and literally just cooking what honest, good home, home style food, you know, and food of your grandmother or your mothers and aunts and I would say even dads and, you know, sort of real, real food. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. And I, I would celebrate that in the sense that for me, the people that have defined food from when I was that big um, have to be my parents and um, their parents and their parents because their relationship with food is incredible. And it just the preparation and the hours it might yeah. take to soak red kidney beans to make rajma and putting it in a pressure cooker with chickpeas to make cholli is like, this is breathtaking. Yeah. It takes overnight it takes hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and it tastes divine um but it's understanding that even more really than when it just hits your your gob really <laughs> you yeah. muscles and gobble it up and it's gone um and actually i had traveled to tibet once and um i was in a monastery there and the monks all eat with their eyes shut and they do so because they believe that uh, with every mouthful you appreciate it more Mm. Um, with your tastes and it's different senses but also they say that you naturally get full up when you are full mm. think of that what you will uh, we have got so many questions and I'm just yeah. conscious of the time here so if it's okay with you I'd love to put some of these uh, to you I'm going to start with um, Carol who has sent this question and saying isn't a lot of food choice due to what a person can afford afford um, if we can do just an answer um, to Carol briefly if we can uh, Ruby yeah, I mean, obviously so much of it is. I think in a weird way, like the some of the some of the disparities between like what people can afford have narrowed in some ways, but then obviously there are still a huge number of people who can't afford anything. So it, it's really dictated by that it is, but then there's also a middle ground where if you have 
you know, 20 quid to go to the supermarket. There's an incredible range of stuff far more than ever before that you can choose from. So there's a lot of choice for some and near no choice for others who maybe have to use a food bank or rely on hands out, handouts in some other way. But also I, I just add as well, and this is something that we've not really touched on yet, but so much of our conversations about food and class revolve around what people can afford. But then there are so many contexts where we have food where it's not even about our individual spending power. So I'm thinking about schools, prisons, uh, company canteens, even just places like this, nursing homes, places where you get fed and where you don't have to turn up with your wallet, but so much to do with class and to do with the budgets and, and sometimes greed of companies and things like that comes into that as well. So they really just does cut across more than just restaurants and, and supermarkets. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I would add to that time as well. I mean, I'm a new mum, my little one's going to be two next month. And um, having time to think about what you're going to be feeding your little one, but also then what they're getting in nursery and, and understanding all of that and how that relationship is born is, is quite something. Um, I'm going to move on if that's okay with everybody, unless you want to jump in with that. But Beth has uh, got a question here saying, um, you've made some great points about the many divides that exist with food inequality in modern Britain. But is there a food that you would consider unites us? One that crosses the barriers of class and culture in terms of enjoyment and importance? Great question, Beth. Mm. Uh, Pen? That's a very nice question. Um... <laughs> well, I'm, real, I'm struggling to think, to be honest, what unites us? Could it be the breaking of bread? Well, you see, I was going to say bread because bread is so universal. And yet, because bread is so universal, we find ways within the bread family <laughs> to kind of differentiate the sliced white or the, you know, sourdough, you know, the whole meal and all the rest of it. Um, and in a way, the more important our food is, or the more to, to, you know, to us, so bread, tea, for example, the more differentiation we'll find it within it. So it's a stupid example, but the scone with the jam and the cream, you know, how could that be different? Yes, of course it can. In Cornwall, it's done one way and in Devon, it's done the other way. You know, in a way we do always find ways of kind of distinct, distinguishing be between us. Um, is that, I don't know if there's one food that's specifically, maybe, I don't know, maybe rice. I mean, except when I cook it, because I, burn it I don't know I'm rubbish at cooking rice um but I think I think you'd be hard pressed to find one food yeah. sorry rice there is you know you have you go to Japan and you eat rice there is completely different to how yeah. you might be having rice yeah. um in West Africa for example you might be having rice in the Punjab I mean yeah there are so many differentiations but um Dee what do you think the food that you know um, because probably it's not food and it might be something like our hands and not to be ableist, but, you know, we all use our hands to prepare food. Um, some of us eat food, you know, with, with our hands. And I think, you know, that unites us. Yeah, I think that's a great one, actually. When I'm thinking about how you might eat food, but then also the making of bread as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ruby? A food that you think? No, nah, it's not going to happen. No, everyone <laughs> no. because so much. I've been on Twitter long enough to know there's no good answer to that. No, there's no good answer. Yeah. And I will say one thing actually is that um, I used to completely hate. <laughs> I talked about Turkey earlier on. I'm not obsessed with Turkey. I used to hate Turkey for Christmas dinner. I just kind of thought, oh God, it's so boring. Can't we have duck or beef or something else? You know, for this kind of big special meal, and since I've been thinking a lot about it and the, that, that question of what actually brings us together and what separates us, I do quite now quite like the idea that on one day of the year, a lot of families in Britain are having the same meal, kind of more or less. I mean, obviously, huge degree of kind of, you know, of, of, dis, of, of well, difference. With some that, I'm going to take issue with that. No, 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 yeah. no, I'm not saying every single, I'm not saying every family in every community, but a lot of people, because if you, because what I've been doing in my work is looking at the way that food divides us, and it does seem to be the, 
historically in Britain, it does seem to be one occasion where it kind of brings at least some people together in the same menu. You see, I don't know, in multicultural Britain today on Christmas Day, for yeah. example, what time people are having their lunch, Christmas dinner, is it before the Queen's speech, after the Queen's speech, which used to be these kind of benchmarkers, didn't they? And also, like, are they having turkey? Or are they having chicken and lamb? Or are they having a no, meal? No, no, sure, sure, sure. Then they're not, of course, not everybody's having absolutely the same meal everywhere, but it's the most homogeneity we get. I take your point. I take your point. Um, mm -hmm. I think we, yeah, if we can, um, we've got this question I'm just, it's quite, from David, who says, would you agree that one of the major problems about the choice of diet in the UK is how food is portrayed in mass media? In spite of there being good programmes about healthy cooking, the overwhelming way in which food is represented in TV programmes uh, is... Uh, fundamental problems with images are very powerful. So how it's portrayed in mass media, that's from David Welsh. Um, Dee, what do you think? Um, yes and no. Um, yes, because of the influence it has on people to want to, you know, have, have that sort of food. But no, because for a lot of people, you know, including myself, it, it doesn't really interest me. You know, it's like faff. And a lot of people think, you know, mass media and advertising is just that, faff. It's not real food. Although they do garner a lot of reach, don't they? There are, I mean, some of these programs yeah. have huge viewing numbers, particularly Ruby, the program that you were involved in back in 2013, Bake Off. Uh, yeah. Yeah, you've... It, oh, I always get weird when that's brought up, but yes, that's true. Um, I mean, well, I think why it's do you those... get weird when it's brought up. Is it uncomfortable? Or yeah, I, yeah. You no, shake it. Off? no, it's fine. It's fine. It, it just always. It shouldn't come as a surprise anymore, but it always does. But I'll uh, I'll teach myself to be better on that count. But I think um, in terms of the way that food is portrayed in the media, I, I think that maybe one thing that we lack a lot is, is a bit more about where food comes from. And I don't mean really romanticizing mm. like the journey of a, a, a single coffee bean from somewhere, you know, in, in this really like expensive way. I mean, in terms of just all foods, like what does it mean for a plate to arrive out from the back of a restaurant? What label went into that and stuff? We never see that. We see the beautiful end plate of food and that's all that we see. We don't see anything about who grew it or who produced it. And I mean, I, I'm currently working in a kitchen and I have done at various points throughout my adult life. And I tell you, it is so intense. It is a lot of hard work, it's exhausting work. And we don't tend to see behind the scenes when we're talking about food. So whether that's, I mean, maybe we see it in something like MasterChef sometimes, but. I think we could do with more of it and, and more to do with who's making the food and who's producing it and how does it arrive in front of us? Yeah, and I think um, just to say in a defensive kind that to bring the Bake Off up with you is because I think understanding to the television programmes and being part of that and then going on to do what you've done, I think it's really, it's, there are a lot of people that have made a success in terms of, food, literature, literature and appearances because of that programme and have done it for great good, as you are doing. But it is interesting to understand that some people think that the mass media or those kind of TV programmes maybe not be truly reflective or valuable as mm -hmm. they could be. I mean, if anything, like I would say that Bake Off makes, makes baking and food in general look 10,000 times more stressful and awful than it really is. So if anything, it's really, it's dragging us down. I think most of the time, you know, these, these kind of competition shows, they're like very fun entertainment. I have absolutely no issues with them, but yeah, food doesn't need to be that stressful. So if anything, let's have a slightly more positive programming. I would say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's about how do you capture the joy and enthusiasm of people who want to learn to cook and, and to bake and, you know, just make it easy. And I think that's what a lot of food teachers do, a lot of community cooks do, um, a lot of women, you know, people who aren't generally represented in yeah. the media. Um, yeah. 
Jill says, what do the panel think about the idea? And this goes into, uh, ties into what we've been talking about, about the idea that there should not be only just a food minister, but also a serious programme to teach cooking and the health aspects of food in schools. So it's exactly, Dee, what you've, you've just pointed out there. Um, Pem, where are we at, do, do you think, in terms of social media, the media world and, and its representation of food in the UK today? question is quite diverse and I think you can find your tribe can't you from on on the whole you know if you're interested in baking if you're interested in cupcakes if you're interested in butchery you can find it somewhere and I think that's probably I wouldn't want that to be different I think where I would totally agree with both Ruby and Dee is to see and this would be a mainstream kind of media thing maybe to see more emphasis on where food comes from and who, who produces it, who grows it, who, you know, on, on farmers, because we do have this expression from field to fork. And we kind of think, as soon as it's got to the fork and us, that's where our responsibility kind of ends. You know, we consume it, end of story. But actually it goes on and it has to go on. We have to feed the next generation of people. You know, it kind of, um, mm -hmm. You know, as Dee was saying, food isn't just about getting food onto a plate. It's all about the environment. It's about make, it's being sustainable. And I think unless food is such, shown not just as something that gets to the plate, but somehow we have a concept of it in a whole system that has to be sustainable. You have to be able to do year in, year out. And if you use the wrong fertilizers now, you won't have food and you won't have soil produced food in 10 years time or whatever the, the, the issue is. I think we're only going to see a small part of a very big machine. Mm. Back to that system again. Uh, Tommy's system again. got this question. Um, I think it's to me. It says, you mentioned at the start that Indian food was not celebrated until recently. What has changed? I think what I was trying to say, Tommy, was that um, when my parents came into the UK in the 1960s, um, not many people had seen people of their ethnic background in this country before. Therefore, anything that um, was different about them was seen with scepticism, their food um, and what they wore and what they looked like. And I think that uh, because we now live in a multicultural Britain, we do, by the way, live in multicultural Britain, that the fact that uh, Indian food and all kinds of different types of food from around the world is very much part of our conversation and rightly so. Um, and that is my parents' generation's legacy. And I think, um, as Penn, you were talking about earlier about, you know, immigration and colonialism and all of that, it kind of marries into this conversation of how we are as UK citizens today. Um, I'm really conscious of time and thank you everybody for your questions, but I just want to, um, a couple of questions I want to pick out um, that some, I think will perhaps encapsulate some of the questions that I haven't got round to asking from our guests as well is, um, what would you just say would be your, your tip for thinking about food and class in the UK today and, and what we could really learn from your vision and your research that you've all done. Um, Dee? Um, I would say stop thinking as a consumer and become a food citizen so that you're really thinking about all those issues around power and democracy, um, environment and climate and sort of making informed choices. Yeah. I love that being a food citizen. Um, absolutely. Um, Pen, Ruby, Ruby, do you want to go ahead next? Um, you can't get better than what Dee said. That was brilliant. I think, I guess I'd just say less of the thinking about what food says about you or what the food in someone else's basket says about them and a little bit more about just thinking, is there food? Is there enough food? Is there enough choice? Just, I guess, you know, less like cultural analysis of the food in front of us and a little bit more just making sure there is food to start with, making sure that the material conditions are met so that everyone can eat. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, Penn? I think I would say absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more with either Dee or Roby. Um, and also, just going back to that point that good food, 
the food that we should all we should all be aspiring to eat and share good food you know I think that's really important food is obviously the kind of key to our health and our social health and our communities and for those to work well it's got to be good food and we should be we shouldn't be compromising on it because we feel that's you know it should start with good food and, and is it scalable is it something that we can share with everybody absolutely um soul food is how i'm going to end it there soul food. That's, that's great expression. Soul food. um pen d ruby thank you so so very much i could talk to you for hours um but it's been great to uh, be part of this evening session and thanks to everybody joining in Andrew, i'm going to hand back to you thank you so much um babita and everybody that was completely extraordinary absolutely absolutely fascinating um it's one of those things where in an hour somehow you manage to all weave everything together and draw out a lot of perspective and context but also really drill into some of the things which affect so many of us are moving forward it was really really brilliant thank you so much um and thank you to KitchenAid who support the work of the British Library Food Season there is plenty more to come from us we're here through until the end of May um proving just how eclectic uh, and broad-ranging the food season is next up is uh, Raymond Blanc on Saturday uh, we're down at Le Manoir with him having a conversation with Felicity Cloak um you can head to the British Library webpage and see all the events there lots lots more to come um if you'd like to support the work of the British Library there is a donate button on your screen um I'm off to go and have some fish fingers um I really hope you've all enjoyed tonight as much as I have um but for now thank you and goodbye from the British Library food season <laughs>